Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. This is Arthur from Kepler Speaking. Welcome to our third webinar about the impact of the COVID crisis on energy and commodity markets. On behalf of Kepler teams, I would like to thank you very much for the increasing attendance to our webinar. This is definitely something our teams are receptive to. To start with, I would like to tell you a bit more about our methodology because we've been asked recently about how we managed to produce uh, our market intelligence. So we'll go through that very quickly before we start the webinar. Let's take the big picture. Uh, if we look at it, uh, we can see that actually the way we produce market intelligence is essentially by aggregating a large amount of raw and diverse data coming from those many different, uh, different sources you see on the left of this slide. These sources will include AI signals, port authorities reports, uh, ship agencies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, after the, the data is sourced, processed, and then aggregated, uh, we deliver it to our users in an understandable way so that they get a clear picture of the market. Actually, we could, we could say that what our users see is a reassembled puzzle uh, of the market, either through a web, uh, the web or mobile app you already know, or through API or Excel add-in. Um, this full process is mainly done in an automated way and in real time, thanks to artificial intelligence technology. And in addition to that, we have a team of data analysts who control and help improve this process on a permanent basis. So the information that we deliver to, to clients uh, we, want to make, you, we want to make sure that it makes uh, sense to commodity professionals. This is why many of our data analysts controlling the data uh, actually come from the market. Now, if we have a closer look at how we get figures regarding crude oil onshore inventories, it's a bit more specific. Here, we will rely on three main sources, satellites, uh, optical imagery, satellite radar imagery, and cargo tracking data. Satellite images allow us to know the level of utilization of storage facilities equipped with floating roof tanks. We analyze it from uh, with satellite images and we can see uh, what the level of uh, capacity utilization in those uh, facilities. But thanks to the cargo tracking data, we can refine our figures and extend our coverage uh, to uh, two other types of tanks, fixed roof tanks and underground caverns. Of course, those two uh, types of, 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 of tanks cannot be analyzed from uh, satellite, uh, with satellite images, but with cargo, tra with cargo tracking data, we can analyze them and know what's inside. So, because we cover these three types of tanks together, we can say that we have the largest coverage capacity when it comes to onshore storage. This capacity amounts to more than 6 billion barrels today. Uh, I'll stop here for the methodology and introduce the team of behind, the, behind this webinar. Um, the team, uh, the research and analysis team of Kepler is called Periscope. It's led by uh, Alex Booth, based in London. Uh, Alexandre Andauer and Romayun Falakshahi are also in London. Reid is based in Houston. And Kevin is a new joiner, is, uh, is based in Singapore, and he's the lead analyst for the APEC region. Periscope's mission is essentially to provide the market with analysis and insights based on Kepler data. So this webinar is actually a good example of what they do on a daily basis for individual clients. Just a few technical recommendations before we start. As usual, your participation, of course, is anonymous. Don't worry, we, we will send you the slides after this presentation. You will receive a follow-up email tomorrow with a link to the slides. And if you have questions during this presentation, please ask them using the Q&A button in your Zoom window. We will probably not be able to answer all the questions, but uh, send them anyway, and we will try to uh, answer you individually. Okay, I hope you are ready because it's time to start the, the webinar. Uh, I'll leave the floor to Alex Booth uh, in London. Have a good webinar. 
Excellent, thank you, Arthur. Um, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. And again, just thank you for uh, for joining us in our uh, our third uh, third webinar that we're presenting on what's happening in the markets at the moment. So through uh, the course of the this uh, this webinar, we'll have three different sections. Firstly, Omayun is going to run through what <clears throat> we're seeing uh, happening in the kind of the world of uh, crude supply and crude production. Um, what kind of metrics we are using to gauge how that is changing um, and then kind of what some of the ramifications are for what we've seen um, through recent, uh, recent months in terms of how we expect this, this cut to, to materialize. In the second section, Reid will be running through uh, the, uh, some of the more demand-oriented um, elements. So here we're trying to look at um, information that we have available across all of our platforms, whether it's looking at the products, whether it's looking at gases, whether it's looking at what's happening with crude demand and so on. And all of that wraps up into the final section that uh, Alex Ondlau will run through, um, which is looking at what this all means from that kind of overall crude storage point of view. It's kind of such a, a fundamental issue uh, that the market is, that is facing at the moment. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Omayun, who will run through kind of what we're seeing on the, uh, on the crude supply side of things. Sure, thank you. Thanks, Alex, and uh, hi to everyone. Um, so, I mean, as Alex mentioned, you know, with the impact of um, COVID-19 on demand, we've seen a lot of excess supply being produced uh, and exported to reach markets. Um, so that's clearly visible in the amount of um, crude and condensates that were loaded in the past few weeks, and, and this is what we're going to see right now. So what you can see on this chart is the amount of loadings uh, from the beginning of the year, basically. I mean, you can easily see that there was a clear bump that occurred in early April. That was a direct result of OPEC and OPEC Plus not being able to reach an agreement uh, back in early March. Uh, and a result also of uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the UAE all saying that they will supply the market with their maximum capacity starting from uh, April. Um, so, I mean, we've seen in previous webinars what was behind such decision. You know, it was really the fact that OPEC Plus uh, was losing market share uh, versus non-OPEC countries, so countries like Brazil, Norway, Guyana. Uh, but most importantly, uh, from the U.S., the, the, the United States were able to grow their market share from just 1% five years ago to 7% of global seaborne oil exports um, at the beginning of 2020. Um, so since OPEC plus reached its historic agreement to cut production by almost 10 million barrels per day, so that's 10% of global supply, so exactly 9.7 million barrels per day, uh, so that was reached on the 12th of uh, April. Um, and since that day, you can see here on the chart on the right, so you have the OPEC um, exports in orange and OPEC plus the countries, part of OPEC plus but not part of OPEC in blue. Um, so we, we've seen uh, their exports and loadings uh, come down quite significantly from, from that date, even though the agreement is only applicable from the 1st of May. Uh, so in total, we're now about 4 million barrels per day less in terms of loadings compared to the peak that we've seen in early April. Um, most of this decline so far has come from OPEC itself uh, with about 2.5 million barrels per day. Uh, and 80% of this decline from OPEC uh, was due to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait cutting their exports. So countries part of OPEC plus, uh, but not members of OPEC per se, have also cut exports by about 660,000 barrels per day, most of which uh, from Russia. Um, and last but not least, um, you know, we have seen the oil price crash uh, of the past few weeks already having impacts on uh, global production. Uh, so uh, globally, looking at OPEC++ and not just looking at OPEC+. Um, and this has contributed to a decline of about 1 million barrels per day. So again, here just speaking of, of countries completely out of OPEC+. Uh, so most of this has occurred in the US actually, um, and Ecuador, uh, which is actually a former OPEC member 
uh, although Ecuador's decline is most likely due to uh, infrastructure issues rather than pure production shut-ins. So now let's focus a little bit more on the three main uh, GCC oil producers within OPEC, so namely Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Kuwait. Um, so what you can see on the chart here is the amount of exports on a yearly average basis uh, from these three countries. And at the top of the chart, you see the sum, so the total, if you add these three countries together on a yearly basis again. Um, so, I mean, really the up and downs we've seen on the previous chart that on the previous slide that the up and downs in OPEX exports in April were mostly the factor of these three countries accelerating production and now are curtailing it over the past two weeks. Um, so there's basically one key point uh, that I think is worth highlighting here. And it's the fact that in terms of exports, we are currently at the all time high if we look at these three countries combined. So coming back to the OPEC plus agreement that was reached um, earlier in April, these three countries together should cut production by a total of 3.87 million barrels per day for May and June. So almost 4 million barrels per day. And if you assume that this production is going to get cut uh, from exports, I mean, it just shows this chart, just, just show you how big of a task this is going to be for them. I mean, such levels will bring them down to below 10 million barrels per day in terms of export. This is something we've, we've actually never seen in terms of, um, of so looking at these three countries, at least not on an annual average basis. The last time we've seen exports below 10 million barrels per day for these three combined, uh, these three countries combined was in early 2013. Um, the other point that uh, I wanted to mention here looking at this chart is the fact that at the slide, it's the fact that the reference output number being used by OPEC uh, can be very dodgy actually. So if, if we focus on the UAE, for instance, um, their reference production number uh, on which they have based their, their uh, pledge cut is of 3.1 million barrels per day. While if we look at their export, they're actually exporting above this level. Um, let alone the fact that they also produce oil and condensate for their domestic demand, about 800,000 barrels per day. So they're actually, they're actually much, much higher than, than what they, they are using as a reference. Um, and this brings me to the uh, topic of compliance. So one, one key thing that we have seen over the past two years, if we look at exports, is the fact that compliance has been extremely low um, within OPEC and, and OPEC+. Plus. So the fact that we have a new and ambitious OPEC uh, plus deal uh, does not necessarily mean that this will translate into reality on, on physical markets. Um, and again, the reason for this being that previous compliance, according to us, has been, has been very poor. Um, so we've, we've actually had the idea of creating a compliance monitor tool uh, in which we have taken the differential, the differential sorry, between exports and uh, a reference baseline. So again, here we, we look at exports directly, uh, why OPEC uh, focuses on production. So we think it makes more sense to look at exports differential, given these directly impact oil markets. Um, and we've, we've also included products differential exports, products exports differential. Um, and this is mostly to account for the fact that domestic energy policies could skew compliance levels. So if you assume that a country decreases its crude exports, but at the same time uh, uses its refining capacity to, to produce more uh, products and export these products instead. So uh, obviously we think this, this uh, also impacts the level of compliance. So that's why we have included this in, in our um, compliance monitor tool as well. And the, the result basically is quite astonishing. So what you see here on the chart, on the right is the differential between what, what, what is happening right now in, in April in terms of exports compared to our reference baseline that, that we have used to so the month of October 2018. We've used the same month as, uh, as OPEC. And basically what you can see is that in total, OPEC plus is currently about 600,000 barrels per day higher than its previous cut target. So obviously um, a lot of a lot of this will have been impacted by the decision uh, from, this, from Saudi Arabia and the UAE to produce and export a lot more in, um, in the month of April. 
but still, uh, even before that, we were uh, we were much we were quite far from from the targets for the pledge target that they had. Um, in fact, if you exclude the exempt countries um, from the agreement, so namely Iran, Libya, and Venezuela, which you can see here at the top of the chart, we are uh, actually four million barrels per day higher than the previous cut target. So not even speaking about the one that, that was reached just two, three weeks ago. Uh, Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Russia alone are about 3.75 million barrels per day higher. Um, and, and I think this really shows you who really triggered the oil price war uh, over the past few weeks. Um, and you know, there'll be pressure on everyone to cut, uh, but these three countries are starting from a much higher base uh, compared to, to the others who, who didn't have that sort of um, ability to increase uh, production over the past few few weeks. And last but not least, but OPEC plus this time cannot, ca cannot count on uh, cuts from exempt countries anymore uh, to reach their targets. So, you know, in the past, it's in fact, it's US sanctions on Iran and Venezuela and the civil war in Libya, which have allowed OPEC plus as an organization to reach its targets. Uh, this time, the downside uh, risk from Iran and, and Venezuela is, is extremely limited, even their exports have, have already decreased quite massively. Um, while Libya, actually, there's an upside uh, risk uh, with the fact that Libya could bring back 1 million barrels per day fairly quickly to, to the market. So when we've talked about OPEC, um, but uh, we're, we're already seeing production shut-ins in the US, uh, as, as mentioned earlier. Uh, and this will have impacts on the global gas and LNG markets as well. Um, so in the past few years, uh, US gas production increased massively. Um, you know, just in the, past three, in the past three years, we're talking of, of, of levels, volumes around 30 BCF per day. Uh, so 30, three, zero just in the past three years. I mean, this is huge. It's, it's about what a country like Iran produces and Iran uh, being the world's third largest gas producer. Um, so at the same time, uh, this is really what allowed the US to become uh, a major LNG exporter, you know, that allowed the, what, what we've called the first uh, wave of, of US LNG. And as you can see in the chart, LNG exports uh, followed the trend of, of gas production growth quite closely. Um, now, with shutting starting to become a reality in the U.S., we could see a shift in uh, LNG exports as well, or at least a, a sort of slowing down in, in, in this growth. And this is helped by the fact that uh, there is an LNG glut globally as well, and that this falling associated gas production is, is, is actually supporting Henry Hub prices in the U.S. So, you know, right now it's... Um, it's quite astonishing, but you have both JKM and TTF trading below uh, Henry Hub, uh, and you know, we're not even in summer uh, in summer yet. So with more shuttings coming in, we could see that that differential uh, grow in the in the coming weeks. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, there are 20 cargos cancelled, uh, 20 LNG cargos cancelled for for June delivery. Uh, this is while the US now sends about 40 cargos a month. Uh, so at, at current rates, it represents about half of their exports, or about 2.5 million tons right now. And this is despite, you know, take or pay uh, mechanisms being in place. So uh, buyers are ready to pay, but not take the, uh, the, the cargo, uh, because it will cost them uh, a lot more to, to actually ship it right now. Um, the last point on this chart is the fact that um, Despite associated gas production uh, coming down with, with shut-ins in the U.S. shale plays, uh, downward pressure on total gas production will be limited in the U.S. Um, because you could see a growth in non-associated gas production instead uh, based on higher Henry Hub prices. So prices of Henry Hub for next winter currently are priced at, at above $3. And this could, uh, this could push some producers to actually grow production from non-associated plays. So that was everything for me. So uh, I'll hand over to Reed uh, in Houston, who will cover uh, the demand side of things. Thanks, Hamayun. Yeah, indeed. I am going to uh, look at kind of global commodity demand. Um, we're going to slide kind of from Asia westward. So um, first, uh, we're going to kind of look at the demand for thermal coal and LNG imports, particularly into China and India. 
If you look at this first chart, you can notice uh, this is your year over year change in trillion BTUs for thermal coal and LNG into both China and India. And you'll notice the large decline in thermal arrivals through um, April um, and a slight uptick in LNG arrivals uh, on the same month. And there are a couple reasons why this is. Um, first, LNG prices, especially for delivery into Asia, have fallen more rapidly than uh, prices for thermal coal. And this has certainly incentivized some uh, coal to gas switching. But secondly, you will have an overall decline in power demand within the region. And so your need for uh, feedstocks in total are also lower. So this is both, both of these reasons are, are having an unusually large impact on thermal arrivals into both countries so far this in April. And moving ahead a bit um, and focusing in on East Asia and kind of looking at the, the question of, uh, you know, the economic recovery that we're hoping to see in the West um, and trying to see, you know, signs of it start to happen, especially in China, who has obviously, you know, as we all know, has reopened slowly. Um, this chart here uh, lists the rolling sum by year for LPG imports into East Asia. You'll notice a, uh, you'll notice the black line was for 2020, current year, uh, 2019 was in orange. And so if you look at February in particular, you'll notice that 2020 arrival levels were running well below year earlier totals. This was when China was in the midst of of deep lockdowns and a complete manufacturing, uh, complete manufacturing closures. Uh, and then into March, arrivals started to pick up again. And then into April now, we're, we're holding above year earlier levels. Um, there are a couple reasons for this. Um, first, uh, typically uh, feedstock prices um, and at, this is the case this year as well. Feedstock prices recently have, have weakened faster than Petkin prices. So what we've seen is a likely buildup of uh, plastics production, um, despite the fact that you don't really have a lot of downstream demand, especially for car production at the moment. Um, so our expectation is it is possible that um, these uh, LPG arrivals could start to slow in the weeks ahead as pet chem prices begin to weaken more quickly and kind of catch up with the feedstock declines that we've seen. Uh, and also, you can only produce so much plastic without having any in demand. The problem is right now that in March alone, car production in China was down by nearly 80% year over year. And it's unlikely that your downstream demand, especially in Western markets, has improved that much, um, even for intermediate inputs. And so um, it, it's possible that LPG arrivals could uh, start to weaken again, moving ahead. Also, one more note on Napa arrivals. Uh, they have been quite weak so far um, through April but we could see a tick higher as we get more clarity on, on the product volumes that have yet to be tacked. And focusing in on China a bit more, um, a lot of questions right now about Chinese oil demand and uh, petroleum product demand domestically. Um, so if you'll note the orange line is domestic inventories um, you'll see through February and March a large increase in domestic inventories of nearly 70 million barrels um, over the two months. Uh, this was largely driven by the fact that Chinese refiners, um, although running at very low utilization levels, were importing a whole lot of spot barrels um, 
because they were cheap. And um, that has uh, obviously import levels have ticked up a little bit in April, as you can see um, with the blue line, uh, the blue bars um, on a month over month basis, arrivals are up slightly year over year basis. They're down a little bit. Um, all in all, this is correlated to a slight decline in domestic inventories um, as runs have increased on the month. Um, it is important to note that these, the, the increase in refinery utilization, and you will see this reported elsewhere, has ticked up in China significantly. But this is not necessarily being driven by market factors. Um, the uh, mandated price for diesel and gasoline within China are uh, lower about 20% year to date. Obviously, this is not near um, the this does not come near matching the declines for imported oil barrels into China, which are down by more than 50%. And what this is doing is incentivizing, um, incentivizing product production. I mean, that's a pretty healthy margin, but that doesn't mean that there is, uh, there is, you know, a, such a, a uh, an equally large increase in uh, domestic demand. So it is likely that the, clean product oversupply question, which we'll talk about in a moment, could be exacerbated by Chinese refiners in the weeks and months ahead. And so we do look now to um, the year over year change in clean product imports. I mean, it's, you know, the, the data speaks for itself. I mean, in North America alone, arrivals for the month of April are down 1.2 million barrels per day, truly historic. And these declines extend to most places globally. Um, and so this is just builds on the fact that you're going to probably have Chinese refiners pumping a lot of clean products into the market, even though you have um, refinery utilization rates um, lower in other parts of the world. And you put that on top of the fact that demand for clean products is falling at a rate we have really not seen in a very long time. And to kind of build on this story a bit further, uh, a lot of these product volumes um, globally are struggling to find buyers. Um, if you'll notice the, obviously the orange line is floating product storage and the blue bars are product on water. Both have increased by more than 30 million barrels <clears throat> month over month, which is uh, just indicative of this, uh, you know, dual problem of oversupply um, because obviously an oversupplied crude market means you're going to run some of these, some of those barrels um, because they're cheap. Uh, uh, and that contributes to an oversupply product market in a market that doesn't have the demand. So, uh, you know, it's, you know, this problem is likely to persist for some time, um, pro probably through the summer. Uh, we will see uh, demand for clean products really struggle. Um, and it is important to note that this demand picture will be delineated a bit. You know, in America, you might see an uptick in gasoline demand. Um, as people start to drive a bit more, but the need for jet and distillates could remain quite limited. Um, whereas in Europe, your demand picture could see a slight uptick in distillates, but again, jet will struggle. And this is gonna be uh, difficult for refiners to kind of deal with because you can't significantly cut jet, uh, cut, uh, jet demand and, and increase gasoline demand, right? It's very hard to, to adjust those cuts. And so, Refiners are going to really have to work to find a way to balance this delineation in product demand over the next few months, especially. And so with that, I'm going to hand, um, hand it over to Alexander Onlayer. He's going to talk about the global oil storage picture. Alex? Uh, 
uh, prices went into negative territory. Uh, Alex, uh, can you can you yeah. re start over, please, because we we've not heard the beginning. Sorry for that. Yeah. Okay. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, uh, Reed. So yeah, let's have a look on the U.S. Uh, onshore crude storage. As earlier uh, this month, double DI prices uh, went into uh, ne negative territory. So if we have a look on the chart, we can see. Uh, two interesting uh, things. The first one is in blue. That's all working capacity uh, in the U.S. So of course, it's mainly uh, driven by Pad Two and uh, Pad Three. Uh, and, and in orange, the second uh, interesting point is the current free capacity. And as you can see, if we compare April to March or even uh, February, we can see that uh, Pad Two and part three, uh, current free capacity decreased, of course, as uh, oil inventories increased. If we look at Cushing, right now, we are at 82 percent uh, capacity. And we expect, uh, regarding the current situation, that tanks could be full uh, in two or uh, three weeks. So of course, in the US, it's not only about and around Cushing, the United States uh, have uh, also some other uh, options. So excluding SPR, we have uh, part three with an additional 65 million uh, barrels available for uh, oil. Outside the, uh, the US, if we move to the next slide, uh, we see, we know that there are technically 1.2 billion uh, onshore uh, crude oil uh, storage uh, available. It's split between uh, government uh, SPR uh, storage and uh, non-SPR for commercial players. However, the 1.2 billion is likely the upper end of the uh, assessment on the basis we take 90% of uh, shell capacity for commercial uh, storage. We can't actually use the full shell capacity due to operational and uh, logistic uh, constraint. If we have a look on the on the map and uh, at the bottom left side, you can see some figures. So here we highlight the non-SPR inventories, which are 2.1 billion. The government inventories, so SPR around the world at 1.4 billion. So all together. Right now, the storage on onshore for crude is at 3.5 uh, billion. On the 1.2 uh, remaining capacity, we can see that it's mainly uh, driven by the U.S. and uh, China. So, in green uh, on the on the map, uh, in China, it's well split between uh, the government SPR, where we still have a uh, 181 million barrels. Uh, for um, uh, non-SPR and for the SPR, we have uh, 175. In the US, it's more driven by commercial um, capacity at 144, while the remaining SPR is at uh, 92. So the, the key takeaway of this slide is that all this capacity are not, again, available because uh, they could be leased or own, and that's why that's the reason why we also had these negative oil prices in the U.S. While we still have some um, capacity uh, in uh, in Cushing. So moving to uh, on how we see the global picture and how that evolved over the last uh, few weeks, we had in April an increase on onshore crude uh, storage um, of. 105 million bars. So that has been a huge increase compared to the previous months. That's what you can see in blue on the um, in uh, an orange in the chart. And in blue, more interestingly, you can see an increase of oil on water at 136 million bars. And this huge increase, which even accelerated actually over the last few uh, days, uh, will. Uh, start to hit uh, destination 
in the coming days and in the coming weeks, meaning that the crude uh, onshore inventories will accelerate actually in May. This oil and water uh, increase has been driven by uh, Saudi Arabia, but also in a lesser extent by uh, Russia. So based on that, and if we take into account the current uh, production and the current demand level, we expect that the uh, crude onshore inventories will likely hit uh, tank tops in the next uh, two months. And I let um, Alex conclude and remind, uh, remind that of the last two days, we had a huge increase in terms of oil on water on our platform. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, so I'll just run through kind of a quick summary that the, some of the key takeaways from, from the slides there. And, and as Alex was saying, we, we put these slides together yesterday. Um, and that's where that was so the numbers for, say, oil on water um, were as of yesterday afternoon when we uh, were kind of checking for the latest numbers this morning and how that's moved through the day. We've added an extra kind of 35 million barrels or so. Um, so it's, um, and that's just over the course of the last kind of 24 hours. So the, the speed with which this is changing is dramatic, basically. Um, so what do we need to see? Well, ultimately, um, the, the OPEC plus or kind of OPEC plus plus alliance, uh, an agreement to cut production needs to be very real and very deep and very quick from where we are today in order for us to see kind of any significant change. And um, it's also worth reiterating that we're, we're not just looking at what's happening with the crude exports, but we also want to see those product exports um, holding, certainly not increasing. And at the same time, we really don't want to be seeing uh, domestic onshore inventories in crew produ in oil producing countries increasing at the same time because that's really just going against the spirit of the agreement where we're not just in an oversupplied crude market but a, a very uh, kind of very demand limited market as well. Next on the gas side it's going to be this very complex balance between the immediate uh, decline in demands that we've seen because of the hits of the global um, in kind of industrial economy, set against some potential growth from where we are due to fuel switching. And then the final element is to say what's happening with that gas production. So as we see declines in oil production and associated gas, do we see at the same time an increase in uh, dedicated gas plays in the US as they grow there? The, the product side of things, the, the green shoots of demand um, are quite tentative, we think. Uh, the petrochemical demand we, is essentially driven by a bit of an artificial margin, um, as, uh, as, as Reid discussed there. Um, if we look at, say, China, if you look at the traffic data that's coming out of the country, yes, there is a pickup generally um, across the country um, in terms of congestion volumes. But then if you look at the footfall data, there is, um, there is evidence that people kind of aren't out and about in the retail malls at the weekends at the same time. So it is very tentative there. Um, and the last element is bringing this all together. Ultimately, this, this sheer scale of the demand hit coinciding with the ramp up in production that we saw um, due to the breakdown in the OPEC plus agreement is going to continue to put a lot of pressure on the uh, global uh, crude on global crude inventories, as I said just now, the the rate with which we can see oil on water build is phenomenal. Um, there will be logistical constraints in the onshore system, so there will be kind of a limit as to the rate at which that can move onshore, and so we'll just see a bit of a concertina effort uh, or effect, sorry, um, between onshore and offshore kind of inventory builds until those. Uh, facilities are ultimately filled to their operational limits. And that's something that we're going to be expecting to see in the next couple of months, basically. So I'll hand you over to Arthur, who can, uh, who's going to moderate some of the questions. I think we've had quite a few. And just to say, we will uh, re reply to any that we don't get around to answering kind of in this session today, basically. Yes, we will take two questions uh, at the end of this webinar. 
First one is the following. Will the loss in associated gas production resulting from the closure of shell oil wells cause an uptick in Henry Hub prices and a subsequent increase in gas-only ENP activity? Reid, uh, do you want to answer? Yeah, I'll take this. Uh, super interesting question at the moment. Um, obviously, the EIA in 2018 published associated gas volumes, which can be kind of difficult to obtain. And we know that about uh, likely around 40% of natural gas production is a result of, of associated gas output. Obviously, associated gas output comes from, from an oil well. Um, you know, it is likely that if we see a 50% decline in shale production, uh, we could see um, initially uh, this associated gas output drop by 5 to 10%. Um, now, will this affect prices? Probably, it will probably be a, a positive factor for prices. And, you know, in theory, this should incentivize some uh, gas only exploration and production activity, especially in the Marcellus Shale region. Um, the, the big question is debt levels. Um, Chesapeake, which is the biggest player in this, in this area, obviously has big struggles right now. And I think that um, Chesapeake is, is kind of going, it, it kind of points to a broader issue right now, which is, you know, where is the capital going to come from if you want to step into this market and, and increase gas production? So I would say most likely we will, we will see an increase in, you know, gas only output, but we're going to kind of have to wait and see, I think right now. Well, thank you, Reed. Next question goes to Alex Booth. Alex, do you see activity of onshore U.S. operators attempting to increase temporary storage capacity? Um, yeah, so this is something that we've been asked uh, a couple of times recently as well. And the, the temporary nature um, is something that uh, I, I think it's difficult to address in any kind of volume that we need. So that in terms of temporary storage, that's vessels. Um, but what we have looked at is how quickly we have seen tanks build. So as we map our universe for crude storage, we, uh, we can see kind of because of the satellite images, the, the, the build stages. And um, if we look, I think we were looking at Corpus as an example, from uh, ground clearance through to commissioning, uh, we were seeing tanks built in a six month time frame. Now, obviously that is on the basis that you have all of the permits, et cetera, you have the ground ready, um, but that, that's the kind of time frame that we've seen um, as we've been looking at this. So I think it's very difficult to do anything on a temporary basis, as I say, that's ultimately vessels, um, but in terms of a more permanent fixture, which may well come down the line because ultimately this oil I think it's being put away and it's going to be staying there for a very long time in terms of any kind of demand pickup. Um, it, it, you, you're into the kind of six month territory, basically. Well, thank you, Alex. Uh, we'll take another question, actually. Uh, the last one uh, for Homayun. Uh, Homayun, is there any other associated gas other than the USA at risk of declining due to crude oil cuts across the world? further threatening LNG supply. Um, hi, thanks, uh, Arthur. Um, so the, the, the answer to the question is yes and no. So yes, there will be uh, more associated gas uh, production being, uh, being cut as a result of uh, oil supply being cut as well. Um, however, this is not likely to impact uh, LNG exports uh, significantly. And the reason being that most of these cuts will happen at countries which either do not export uh, LNG uh, or that anyway do not have the capacity to capture that associated gas. So mainly thinking of countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait and Iraq. So we'll, have, we'll see a lot of associated gas production come down, but this will not impact the LNG markets. Uh, looking at the main LNG produ producers and exporters in the world, most of them, most of the biggest ones have production uh, coming from non-associated gas production. So the feedstock to the LNG plants is coming from non-associated uh, gas fields, such as Qatar, Australia, but also Indonesia, Malaysia, 
uh, all these countries will not be uh, very much impacted. So the main impact is really going to be uh, seen in the US. You could see some very small impacts at, but at very small producers such as uh, Angola, for example, uh, which exported about uh, 4 million tons last year, or uh, Cameroon, which exported just 1 million tons. Uh, the, the main risk, I think, also in Africa would be Nigeria. But apart from that, not, not much impact on LNG markets. Well, thank you very much, Omar Uh Unfortunately, we cannot take all the questions. Uh, we'll try to answer you uh, by email. We'll do our best. Uh, we are reaching now the end of this webinar. Thank you very much for your participation and for your questions. Tomorrow, uh, as I said in the introduction, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the presentation. And um, I will just finish in saying that what you've seen in this webinar uh, has been produced by the Periscope team. Uh, and if you are interested in receiving their reports, well, please reach out to periscope at Kepler.com. Thank you very much and goodbye. See you next time.